So good afternoon. Welcome uh, to the session in the Healthcare and Life Sciences track. Uh, my name is Andy Day. I'm the Senior Director for Healthcare and Life Sciences at Tableau. I was actually one of the co-founders of the Healthcare and Life Sciences uh, business, and as well as this track. So it's personally gratifying to uh, see that every presentation we've, we've had thus far has been standing room only. It's actually a rare honor and a privilege for me to introduce our next speaker. I'm going to start with an anecdote. Do you remember the story about Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's the CNN you know, correspondent and a neurosurgeon? He's covering the war in Iraq, and, and he sees a patient uh, you know, who's injured and actually opens it up and, and fixes, fixes it, which made headlines and, and quite a story. Uh, so similar story, uh, it kind of resonates around our next speaker, who's actually a doctor trained in, in infectious diseases, a physician of infectious diseases, who's now pushing the edge in terms of healthcare informatics and analytics. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Ari Robisek about four hymns ago. Uh, when he was at North Shore, uh, and, and he had done some incredible work in terms of integrating Tableau with Epic uh, that was actually triggering clinical workflows uh, into Epic from, from Tableau. Uh, he's now with, with, with uh, Providence uh, Health and Providence St. Joseph's Health, which is officially the third largest healthcare system in this country. And he's taken that work and his passion for data science uh, to be able to drive higher patient care, quality, and efficiency to a whole new level uh, with this platform he calls the value-oriented architecture, which actually allows you to correlate the holy grail, outcomes with cost of, of care, uh, down to a very, very granular level. Uh, he's a huge thought leader. Uh, he's, he'll be presenting in another city tomorrow morning. So we are indeed privileged to have him take the time to come and present here. So with that brief introduction, uh, Ari Rabisek, who I'm very, very fortunate to call my friend. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you who uh, found the room and made the trek. Uh, I, I appreciate it. So um, actually, before I start, I just want to make sure that I give credit for a lot of the work uh, here. It, it takes a big cast to be able to do the sorts of things that I'm going to be talking about. And I'm the guy who gets to present to you, but uh, through you know, one of the weird ironies of management, um, I'm one of the people who did the least work on what I'm going to be talking about. So I don't know if they're here, but uh, Troy Hannonen has been a gigantic contributor to this, and uh, so, have, uh, so has Gene Howe and a whole variety of other people from the Providence St. Joseph system. So thank you guys for coming. Um, so let me uh, start by doing the usual, kind of telling you a little bit about our healthcare system. We're big uh, and we're rapidly growing, so rapidly that when I submitted this slide to Tableau a few months ago, um, a, a bunch of this data is now wrong. Um, so we're 51 hospitals, we're about 120,000 caregivers, that's employees. We have uh, some 25,000 physicians. We've got a high school, we have a university thrown in there. We have a health plan, we have a, you know, when people ask me like, do you have an X? I say yes, somewhere we have an X. And people often will ask me like, are you using Y software program or process and procedure, et cetera, and I always say, for whatever thing you're asking about, someone somewhere in the organization is using it, and someone somewhere in the organization is not using it. So we are a big, sprawling kind of organization. We're in seven states. And here's our burning platform, and I think this is gonna sound very familiar to many of you. And, and you know, one thing that I should say up front is I don't have the hubris to think that the solution that I'm presenting today is better than solutions that you guys have developed to this problem in your own organizations. In fact, I'd be very interested to hear how you guys are approaching this problem as well. So I'm gonna show you one approach to this particular problem. So indulge me in a hypothetical. Imagine that you are a senior leader in a 50, no, 51 hospital healthcare organization, and somebody gives you this data reflecting the cost to you of knee replacements when they're done by orthopedic surgeons in your facilities 
where each circle represents one orthopedic surgeon's average cost per case. And we've already cleaned up the data. We've removed small volume orthopedic surgeons. These are only the high volume guys in the system. And we've already made sure that we're comparing like to like. So these are only primary unilateral knee replacements. And um, imagine that these are real data and further imagine, so these are, and these are just direct variable costs from the frame of reference of the hospitals. This is how much it costs us when these different surgeons operate at our hospital. Now imagine that that red line represents how much we get paid for doing these procedures by our number one payer. In this hypothetical, we have a problem. And, and for those of you who can't see it, to give you a sense of the range of cost per case, down at the bottom, we have a surgeon who's operating at $6,600 a case, and up at the top, we have a surgeon who's operating at $10,300 a case to us. And in this hypothetical, these differences are very consequential to you because you do 10,000 of these a year. So what do you do? Where do you start to approach a problem like this? And we heard um, from uh, Paul uh, Lampy this morning, I thought a, a really nice approach that they're taking at Memorial Hermann to this. Um, I can tell you that what many physician leaders particularly do when they see that graph is they say, I want to know who that yellow guy is at the top. <laughs> and so we actually modeled out what would happen to our system average cost per case if we found all the docs whose cost per case was at the 75th percentile and above and brought them down to the 75th percentile. And the answer was, if we did that, so if we focused on just the high cost docs, we would have brought down our system average cost per case by 1%. We need to bring it down by about 10% to break even at Medicare. So that approach isn't going to work. What I would argue is we need an approach that actually brings down everybody's cost per case. Everybody in that graph has an opportunity to come down. Why do I think everybody in that graph has an opportunity to come down? Some of them, after all, look like they have a relatively low cost per case. So let me tell you a story with a graph. What we're looking at here, still stick in for the moment on total knee replacements, primary unilateral elective total knee arthroplasty. What you're looking at is all those docs and the ratio of their cost per case to the system average. So everybody above the horizontal line is high cost relative to the average, everybody but below the horizontal is low cost relative to the average. You guys with me so far? Okay. Now we're just looking at implant cost because that's the biggest contributor to cost per case when we're talking about knee replacement. So here's my thought question for this group. Do you think that the docs whose cost per case is low on implants, so those are the guys who are below the line, do you think that those are the same docs whose cost per case is low on OR expenses, which is the second biggest driver of cost for knee replacement? So do you think the guys who are low here are going to be low there too? Or do you think they're going to be high? Or do you think you can go either way? All right, you guys are analysts. So <laughs> it can go either way. And I haven't just cherry-picked this. This is true when you look at pharmacy costs. This is true when you look at room and board costs. This is true when you look at supply, non-OR supply costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, if we just take a moment and, and be scientists about this, this, ex this phenomenon exists in a fractal way as well. So let's say we just look at the pharmacy costs specifically, okay? So some docs are high cost on pharmacy, some docs are low cost. We have sort of a bimodal distribution. Pharmacy is the one in the middle. So those docs whose pharmacy cost is low, they don't have an opportunity to reduce their pharmacy cost per case, right? Well, let's take the pharmacy cost and split that into its component parts. So for example, the biggest driver of pharmacy costs is pain control medications, analgesics and anesthetics. Some docs are high, some docs are low. Do we believe that the docs who are low in cost of pain control medications are going to be low in, for example, hematological agents? And the answer, of course, is no. Docs are all over the place. The bottom line on this is that, as I think everybody in this room knows, clinical practice variation is the state of nature in medicine. And we are variably variable. Another way of putting this is that 
every doctor, no matter how low cost their, um, the, it, it, no matter how low cost it is when they care for patients, has an opportunity somewhere in their practice to reduce their cost further. Or, and this is the way I present this to clinicians, there are no good doctors and bad doctors here. Everybody has an opportunity to reduce waste in their practice, and everybody can do that by learning from their peers. And so the challenge for me as an analytics person is how to create a data platform with visualizations sitting on top of that that are compelling and actionable to clinical audiences to help them learn from each other to reduce their cost per case. So when we embarked on this project, and literally this project, well, I'll tell you in a moment. Um, it, it, I, I suspect that some of you will have been in conversations that start like this. There's a room full of physicians, and there's an administrator sitting at the head of the table, somebody from like the CFO's office maybe, um, or maybe a service line director. And what they do is they say, okay, here's your unit cost per DRG. And we think there's an opportunity to reduce your unit cost per DRG because someone, Milliman, the advisory board, so we're comparing numbers across our organization. For some reason, we think you guys have an opportunity to reduce your unit cost. Those conversations, they go great, right? <laughs> they go terribly for a bunch of reasons. One of them is the doctor's attitude is like, who are you, an administrator, coming and telling me how to practice medicine? Second of all, DRG. What's this DRG nonsense? So my unit cost is low for, like high for esophagitis, gastroenteritis, and miscellaneous digestive disorders? I mean, that's a chapter in a medical textbook, but that's not a disease, right? There's telling me that my unit cost is high on that is not at all meaningful, right? Likewise, you're not showing me costs, you're showing me charges, which we all know are kind of funny money. Also, um, when you show me my data, I say, okay, let's say I believe you, tell me why my costs are higher, and so then they'll pull out a giant list of every single thing that I ever used, that I ever ordered on a patient, and I, that's not useful to me. How do I make sense of that? How do I turn that into something actionable? And the worst part of these conversations is the doctor says, let's say we get past the fact that I don't believe anything you're saying. And, we, and let me just suspend my disbelief for a moment. Let's say my unit cost really is higher than it should be. Maybe that's what we want because maybe my clinical outcomes are better than my colleagues' clinical outcomes. So maybe we want to spend that extra $300 a case if we get better clinical outcomes. So, Fundamentally, what the conversation needs to be about is not just cost, it needs to be about value. It needs to be about looking at cost and clinical outcomes together. And so, where this project began was actually in a conversation between me and uh, our head of perioperative services in the organization on like day three after I joined Providence St. Joseph Health about two and a quarter years ago. We were in his office and I drew this graph on his whiteboard where I said, imagine if for every doctor in the system for a given clinical condition, we could make one axis represent their cost per case and one axis represent some universally accepted measure of their outcomes. Then we'd have a value plot, right? We could look at both together. And then I was like, huh. Maybe we could do that, maybe. And of course, like everything else, you know, my, my first thought of how it would go was sort of way underestimated the complexity involved in doing this. Um, and my first thought, of course, required thousands of revisions um, to get to what I'm showing you today. And I'm sure if I present it next year, there would be another thousand revisions. But you get the idea. That's where it came from. So we wanted to find some way of representing value graphically. We also wanted um, the platform to allow users to rapidly drill down in some meaningful way and actually see what's driving the differences between their cost per case and somebody else's cost per case. We wanted the data to be clinically meaningful so that it was actually actionable to doctors um, so that, for example, we could make real apples to apples comparisons across clinicians and I'll talk about how we go about doing that. And we really wanted strong data presentation, including statistical discipline to help people separate signal from noise. 
So here was the idea. I'm going back to the graph that I started with at the beginning. So this is every orthopedic surgeon above a certain volume in our system. These are obviously not just hypothetical data. These are real data. Look at everybody's cost per case. All I'm doing is flipping the y-axis here. And we did that so that by default in all of our graphs, up is good. So you want to be up on the cost graph because lower costs are up on this graph. OK. If you show this to a doctor, a doctor will, will say that this is literally and figuratively a unidimensional representation of their practice. And what you need to be able to do is include some additional information about their clinical outcomes. And by, by uh, convention throughout our dashboards, further to the right on the x-axis is good. So where you want to be on this plot, which we call, obviously, a value plot, is in that right upper quadrant where compared to your colleagues, and each circle here represents one entity that we're looking at. An entity can be a hospital, it can be a region, it can be an individual doctor. In principle, it could be a nursing unit. But for one entity, for a given entity, if you're up in that right upper quadrant, that means that for a given clinical condition, you're getting good outcomes relative to your colleagues at low cost relative to your colleagues. You guys with me so far? Simple to do, right? Not so simple. So here are some of the steps that were required to make something like this. Um, one of the things we realized very early on is that across our 51 hospitals, um, we have somewhat different accounting systems. And even within hospitals that are using the same accounting practices, the cost of an individual item that a clinician might choose really varies from one hospital to another. So for example, a day of stay in a non-telemetry bed has a different cost in our Los Angeles hospitals compared to our um, rural Oregon hospitals. And that has to do with labor costs and a variety of other things. So if I say to a doctor, your cost per case is high, and he says, why? And I say, well, that's because labor costs are high in the Los Angeles market. He's going to be like, that's not helping me at all, right? Because that is not under that doctor's control. And so what we wanted to do was limit the differences that we reveal to these clinicians between one another to those differences that are under their control, utilization choices that they make. And to make that happen, we needed to normalize our costs, meaning we needed to come up with standardized unit costs for every single one of the million or so different items in the charge master. So that's what I mean when I talk about normalized costs. So that if we're talking about a particular test, like a blood gas, that arterial blood gas across every hospital, when a user chooses to look at the normalized cost version of the dashboard, every single blood gas has exactly the same cost across our system. And just to show you what happens after we normalize costs, the graph on the left is before normalization. The graph on the right is after normalization. What I'm doing is I'm showing you OR costs for four of our hospitals. Each hospital is represented in a different color. The x-axis is the amount of time that a case spent in the operating room. The y-axis is how much we said that that case costed. So each circle is one case. And what you can see is that the relationship between time spent in the operating room and how much we said it cost is quite different for different hospitals. For example, seven hours in the operating room at the green hospital, we say that's $15,000. Seven hours in the operating room at the blue hospital, we say that's more than $25,000. That's pre-normalization. After normalization, if you look at every single case, it looks like the graph on the right. Not absolutely perfect, but a much closer, um, a, a much, much, much closer fit. Meaning, if you spend seven hours in the operating room, anywhere in our system, we'll assign approximately the same cost to it. The next thing that we needed to do besides cost normalization was assemble some kind of taxonomy for the million different costed items so that we wouldn't just say to a doctor, oh, your costs are high, and here's every single thing that you do. And so we created a clinically intuitive taxonomy. Some of that involved actually merging the, for example, pharmacy taxonomies out of First Data Bank and uh, Medispan. Some of that involved creating our own brand new taxonomies, for example, for imaging and laboratory stuff. Um, and so we built that and created a three-level hierarchy where level one are very high-level categories of cost, pharmacy, OR, room and board, imaging, et cetera. The next level of our hierarchy are, are um, each of those things, but broken down into broad clinically intuitive categories like pharmaceuticals, we'd break into 
um, antibiotics and pain control meds and hematological agents, et cetera. And then level three of that taxonomy are the actual individual costed items. And if you're like, why is he telling me this? You'll see why in about five minutes. So it turns out to be important. Okay. So how do we get to the, like, the little thing that I drew on the whiteboard that day? The one axis is cost and the other axis is clinical outcomes. So we, do our, we consume our cost data from our various accounting systems. We normalize it. We feed it into this taxonomy that we developed. Now we need to identify clinical cohorts. And so a huge advantage that my team has in working on this is our system has what we call institutes, where we pull together clinicians, practicing active clinicians from a, for a given interest area from across our entire system. So for example, we can sit down with a room full of cardiac surgeons. And when I do that, when we're building this out for cardiac surgery, I say, here's what we're trying to build out. We think this will be useful for you. Help us build it in a way that it's gonna be meaningful to you. And to do that, here are three questions that I need you to answer. Number one, how do you want us to cohort your patients? The answer often is not just pick these two DRGs, right? Sometimes the answers are complex. Like, we, wanna, we want you to go to the STS registry, the Society for Thoracic Surgery registry, and pull out those cases that are classified as isolated cabbage. We'll do that because if we don't do that, the data just aren't going to be actionable because they're not going to motivate anybody. So that's thing one. Thing two is how do we risk adjust? Because we know that your patients are sicker. Cool. Help, help us figure, help, help us allow you to stratify or risk adjust inside the visualizations that we create. And so we figure out how they want us to stratify. Sometimes it's straightforward, like the orthopedic surgeons when we were talking about large joint replacement, all they cared about was, was the case elective or not. That's easy. And when we talked to the spine surgeons about spinal fusion, they said, stratify based on how many levels I operated on. Now, that is not data that was consistently captured in our electronic medical record systems in a structured way. That's data that's buried in the up note. So how do we deal with that? So we actually ended up doing was building a natural language processing tool that reads the op note and figures out how many spinal levels were fused because we needed that to get the doctors on board with the project for risk adjustment. And the third question that I ask them is the most important question. It's what I call the give a darn test and it's about outcomes. I say, okay, I know there are a ton of different outcomes that are possibly measured that need to be reported to various different bodies for your clinical area. Let's do this. For a given outcome that we're considering including in here, imagine I told you, that, and you believe me, that you're doing better than your colleagues. Would you feel good about yourself? And imagine I told you for that outcome, you're doing worse than your colleagues. Would you feel motivated to change your practice? If the answer is yes to both of those questions, that passes a give a darn test. If the answer is no to either one of those, we don't bother. It's, it's not worth the marginal cost of trying to pull those outcomes into this dashboard platform because what we're trying to do is motivate clinician behavior with this platform. And oftentimes, um, the outcomes that we're interested in then that come out of these conversations are not just limited to things we can get straightforwardly out of the electronic medical record system or an administrative coding system. Not uncommonly, we've got to go out to the system we're collecting patient reported outcomes or the system where we're getting patient experience data or NHSN where we're feeding uh, patient infection data, for example. Okay. So on the top then, we've collected our cost data, we've done the things that I described, we work with the clinicians to identify how we're gonna cohort, how we're gonna risk adjust, what the outcomes of interest are. We pull all this data together and we feed it through a statistical engine that the amazing Tom French, somebody, Tom French, somebody on my team, developed that helps us separate signal from noise in our visualizations, and I'll show that in a second. This was just to remind me to talk about our natural language processing. Okay. So I've talked about this plenty. Let me show you what's the what here. And again, I am not pretending that this is the best way to accomplish these goals. This is a way that we've developed at our system. Right in the middle of your screen is a value plot. Uh, the x-axis is clinical outcomes, and by our convention, further to the right is good. The y-axis is cost, and again, by our convention, up is good. So lower costs are up. 
where you want to be is in that right upper quadrant. These are real data. Um, each of these circles represents one of our hospitals. The size of the circle represents the volume of cases done. What we're looking at here, to stick with this one example, is elective primary unilateral total knee replacements. So before I go into some interesting examples, just some general orientation, you can hover over any of these circles, and the tooltip will give you useful data, such as, you see this, this particular hospital way up at the top, um, that's up is good on the y-axis. It looks like their costs for this particular clinical condition are low. Is that statistically significant? Are they significantly different than their colleagues? You can hover over that, and what it says, if you're able to make that out where the arrow is pointing, is cost significance lower in blue, which actually means that they are statistically significantly lower in cost than the rest of our system for that particular clinical scenario. If you wanted to change what the y-axis represents, so to switch it from looking at total cost per case, which is what I'm showing you right now, to, for example, just OR costs, you can do that over there on the left. Um, if you wanted to switch out the x-axis, which at this moment is showing a composite outcome score, which is made up of all of the different outcomes that the orthopedic surgeons decided past the Givitarn test for them, you could go over where I'm uh, displaying now and select any of those individual outcomes to be represented on the x-axis. So you can look at the relationship between any of those various cost buckets and any of the outcomes that have passed the give a darn test. You've also got the ability, um, this is just, as I was pulling together these screenshots, I was just curious about that hospital way to the left. Remember, to the left is bad on the x-axis, and you can see one hospital way out on its own to the left. I was a little curious about whether that was there. I happen to be looking at this moment at patient experience scores on the x-axis. I was curious about whether their patient experience was significantly worse for this particular time period than the rest of the organization. And so I was able to hover over this and where that arrow indicates, see that this is actually significantly worse. You can click on any of these circles to see trend over time. The trend at the upper right of the screen is trend in cost. The trend at the lower right of the screen is trend in clinical outcomes. And some of you sitting close to the front probably can tell that the point that I have an arrow pointing to is colored red. And so what we do is statistical process control testing in the background, and we surface that using color coding in our points, meaning if any of the points in our trend line represent um, significant movement, then we'll highlight those as red if the movement is bad or green if the movement is good. All I've done here is switched my view um, from the view where each circle is one hospital to a view where each circle is one provider. So each of these circles is really one doctor inside our system. Again, you can click on anybody, you can hover over, you can click, you can see trends over time. This is just to show you what a green dot looks like. So this doctor's um, cost per case has been significantly improving over time. Okay, let's go into a real, an example. Um, we're still looking at knee replacements. What you're looking at here, the arrows are pointing at two of our hospitals. They're both medium sized, so a few hundred beds each. Um, and you can see that they're similar in size because the circles are roughly similar in size. You can see that they're at almost exactly the same point on the x-axis, meaning for this clinical condition, and I've switched the x-axis back to our composite score. So on our composite outcome score, they're getting very similar outcomes, very similar size. However, their cost per case is quite different. And um, what I've done here is I've specifically focused in on the pharmacy cost per case. You can obviously use this tool to explore different cost buckets. As I was moving my way through different cost buckets, I saw, hey, there's this fairly dramatic difference between these two similar hospitals. And they're more similar than you think. They're within a few miles of each other in our Los Angeles, uh, in, uh, our, our Los Angeles service area. So the question is, why is one hospital at less than $100 per case on pharmaceuticals and another hospital is closer to $500 per case on pharmaceuticals doing the same procedure within a few miles away from each other? Same kind of hospital. Why would that be? So remember I spent five minutes talking about the, the whole taxonomy that we built? Here's why. So one of the tabs at the top says cost details. You click on that. And it brings you to this visualization. So this is a simple league table. Each bar here represents the pharmacy cost per case. If you had selected OR for that y-axis, it would be OR cost per case. If you had selected imaging, it would be o imaging cost per case. You get it. So this is pharmacy cost per case. Each bar represents one hospital. And what we can do, well, first of all, easily see how the hospitals compare to each other. But Further, I can click on those two hospitals that I happen to select. 
So one of them has a bar that shows about $500, and one of them has a bar that shows about $70. OK, so I've control clicked, obviously, to select two bars. Now take a look at the, at the table on the left-hand side of the screen. That shows a breakdown of pharmaceutical costs at level two of our taxonomy. So now we're beginning to drill down because we're saying like, what's up? What's causing these differences between these two hospitals and pharmaceuticals? Let's look at what pharmaceutical classes, um, let's look at the cost per case for pharmaceutical classes at each of these hospitals. And so all I've done here is I've just blown up that little table you were seeing on the left so that you guys could see it better at the back of the room. And so what you can see is that when we're looking at analgesics and anesthetics as pain control medications, one hospital's coming in at $23 a case and the other hospital is coming in at $367 a case. Why? So you simply click on analgesics and anesthetics and then you move your eye over to the right and what you see on the right is this that the cost per case of this particular medication, liposomal bupivacaine, or if any of you have worked in the orthopedics world, Exparel, is the spend on Exparel is way higher at one hospital than at another. Exparel happens to be a very expensive medication. It's a long-acting long uh, local anesthetic. And um, the folks at the hospital on the right really believe that this is great for their patients. So much so that you can see in the tooltip here, I'm sorry if this, this doesn't show up well, but at the, the expensive hospital, they use this item 99% of the time, and at the less expensive hospital, they use this item 8% of the time. So there are really dramatic practice differences here. These are definitely contributing to differences in cost. You go talk to the doctors and, and they will say what I told you before, but maybe it's better for patients to use this particular agent. Let's go back to our value plot. One of the ways, this isn't the exclusive way, but one of the ways that we could look at what a patient's experience is is looking at our patient experience scores. So be, luckily, that's one of the um, metrics that the orthopedic surgeons selected, it passed the give a darn test for them. So all I've done is I've, I've gone back to the value plot, the y-axis is still pharmaceuticals, but I'm gonna switch out the x-axis from our composite score to our patient experience score. Because I wanna see whether that hospital that's using those really expensive pain control meds is getting better patient experience scores. And remember, by convention, on the x-axis, doesn't matter what the measure is, further to the right is better. So what you can see is that the hospital that's up, up is good, up is cheap, their patient experience scores are not lower than the patient experience scores at the hospital that's spending way more on pain control. Right? And this kind of information obviously is valuable and is influential to clinicians. Here's another example. Um, we're talking now about isolated cabbage, so coronary artery bypass graft. I was actually sh I was, I was demonstrating the dashboard to the chief executive of one of our regions not too long ago, and he happens to be a physician, and he was saying like, show me what this thing can do, and I was playing around, and I happened to switch the y-axis to look at laboratory cost per case for isolated cabbage. And you can see that um, there's a circle kind of close to the, in the bottom left quadrant there. Um, it's kind of a big circle. That's his hospital. Um, and he has a friendly competitor that's the kind of biggest circle at the top of the screen. And the biggest circle at the top of the screen, their average lab cost per case is something like $600, and for the circle at the bottom, that's him, it's more like $1,900 a case. And he said, what's going on there? So I said, no problem. I go into cost details, and I, um, I control click the two bars representing the other hospital and his hospital. And then we turn our eye to the left, and we see that the main category of lab that's generating the difference is general chemistry. And then we, I click on general chemistry, and we look to the right, and here's what we see, that his hospital spend on blood gases was about $200 a case, and at the other hospital, it's about $37 a case. And so the first thing he says is, well, that's probably because we use more expensive assays at our hospital. And I said, remember, we've normalized the cost. And just as a parenthetical point, for those finance people who want to see what we call the true costs, meaning the non-normalized cost, 
that's just a toggle. So you can select true costs too. But anyway, when we work with clinicians, we stick with the normalized costs. So as I remember, we've normalized that out. The cost of a, of a blood gas is $11 standardized across the entire system. You are just doing way more than uh, the other hospitals are doing. Okay, so guess what he says next? Remember, he's a physician. My patients are sicker, right? So I said, ah, we thought of that. Um, <laughs> And so back when we met with the cardiac surgeons, we asked them, how do you want us to risk adjust for when people say my patients are sicker? And they said, we want you to use the STS risk model for mortality for cardiac surgery. No problem. We built that in here. And so I've just gone to the left and I've said, let's only look at one mortality tranche, people less than 2% mortality risk for this procedure. And let's go back and take a look now at what happens after we apply that filter. And it's the same, $30 at one hospital and about $200 at the other hospital. So here's what he says. He says, all right, well, okay, we're doing way more blood gases on the same kind of patients. I'll, I'll give you all that. Here's why we're doing them. We do all these blood gases because it helps us get a patient off a ventilator faster. If we're really on top of what's happening with the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in their blood, then we can get them off the vent faster. No problem. The cardiac surgeons have identified how quick we get a patient off a vent as one of their give a darn metrics. So let's go back to the value plot and look at time on a vent. So I've just switched out the x-axis. And again, the question is, is it the case that the hospital with the really expensive lab tests are getting a much better outcome, which again, further to the right on this graph, and the answer, of course, is no. And I said, Guy, you should, you should, re you should maybe rethink your laboratory practices for cabbage patients. Um, just to get, give you a sense of a few of the other visualizations that we've built. So what I showed you is the kind of core of the initial release. In subsequent releases, in response to information that we've gotten from feedback that we've gotten from our users, we've built a variety of other features. So here are some examples. This is, I know this might be a little hard to read at the back, but this is a heat map. Um, each column represents one entity. You can choose for those entities to be individual doctors or hospitals or regions. The x-axis is different um, cost buckets. So in the example that I've put an arrow beside, this particular hospital spends $500 a case on pharmaceuticals compared to, if you look at the first column, which doesn't have any highlighting in it, that's the system average. And so the system average is about $360 a case, so what's going on there? And so when you click on that square, the $500 a case for that hospital, for this clinical scenario, you get some additional information. One of them is you can see how that's trending over time. And we find that the trends are incredibly useful here because sometimes it's somebody just had a bad quarter for some like weird reason. And so what we really wanna see is that something is persisting or is trending in the wrong direction. So this is trending in the wrong direction, this cost per case. Um, because that question of clinical outcomes is at the forefront of our thinking when we're looking at this, we've actually included graphs that show the various different clinical outcomes to the right there, and I'm sorry that I haven't blown this up, but you can see that the, those bar charts are broken into two different kind of clusters, one for those metrics where higher is better, and the other for, where, for those metrics where lower is better. We found, again, through user testing that it was just a lot clearer to users if we separated those out, and you might be able to discern there's a, 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 a green line that runs vertically across these bars that shows the system average for every metric. And um, I'm not sure if you can see this from where you're at, but some of those bars have a little asterisk in the label and that indicates that that um, metric is significantly different from the system average. Okay, but here's why we really built this thing. Um, scroll down a little bit to get the rest of the story. And so why are pharmaceutical costs at this hospital so high? You scroll down a little bit and it takes you right down through that taxonomy and tree maps. So why are those costs so high? Specifically, that giant blue block is pain control medications. What pain control medications specifically? And so you can see that huge blue block is liposomal bupivacaine. So this is Expril. Again, it's the same thing that I showed you before, but it's a different kind of visual heuristic for getting at that, this information. And like, why do we build multiple different ways to get at the same information? Because we have different user personas and different people um, need to see the data in different ways. And we certainly do find also that, uh, that many of our users, this is something that, that I didn't know up front. I kind of had this 
this vague notion that the users for these dashboards would be physicians themselves. What we've discovered is that the consumers are physicians, but the users of the dashboard are not. Here's what I mean. Somebody in a physician's department, often it's a service line director, their job now is to go to the dashboard, find valuable things to have conversations about with clinicians, put them into PowerPoints, and then sit down with the physicians and show this data to them, right? So right or wrong, good or bad, um, I was excited to see the PowerPoint feature this morning. Um, <laughs> and so we were right, in retrospect, to pitch this data to the hearts and minds and ways of thinking of clinicians. But we were wrong to expect that doctors themselves would be the primary users of these dashboards. Doctors do use it, but they're not the primary users of these dashboards. Here's a, a kind of a cool thing that I, I thought I would share. Um, one question that comes up a lot is, what is our opportunity framed in dollars? Like if we cut all the waste out of this, I don't know, laboratory usage in spine surgery, how much money would we save? And this is a very important administrative question because we, we need to ask ourselves, you know, where is our marginal dollar for cost reduction best spent? So here's an approach that we've taken to this. We have the, the uh, pain and the benefit of having a big system. And so what we're able to do is for every element of cost, and for those of you who've been like really, really paying attention, this is for every element in level two of our taxonomy. So level two is like, if we're talking about pharmaceuticals, it's pain control meds, antibiotics, hematological agents, et cetera. For every level two item in our taxonomy, we create a histogram that looks like this. And so we see how many doctors have a spend of $10 a case for that category of item? How many doctors have a spend of $15 a case? How many doctors have a spend of $20 a case, et cetera? And so what you get is a histogram that looks like this, and then we actually pass that in R, so this isn't Tableau, this visualization comes out of R. We pass that in R through a clustering algorithm that actually divides physicians into some number, doesn't have to be four, can be two to N, of distinct practice patterns. And then what we do is we say, those doctors on the left-hand side of this graph, they're the reference group. It's the first cluster that has at least 10% of the physician population in it. We define them as the reference cluster. So then, back to my question, how do we figure out what our opportunity is? We can say, for example, for lab tests done in spine surgery, for every single doctor who's not part of the reference cluster, what is their cost per case? How different is that from the reference cluster? Multiply that by their number of cases, and that gives us, we get that it's a ballpark, but it gives us a ballpark sense of that doctor's opportunity. Obviously, we can aggregate that up at the hospital level, the system level, to help us figure out where we ought to be focusing. Okay, so how to put that kind of information, how to take that information and put it into visualizations? So this is a table, and again, apologies if this is hard to see, but what we're looking at here is one particular clinical scenario, this is PCI, not important what it is. Um, each row in this table represents one of our level two items in the taxonomy. And what this shows us is system-wide, what is our total dollar opportunity? Meaning, if we moved every doctor who's not in the reference cluster for that item over to the reference cluster, how many dollars would we reduce from the system? So that's fine from an administrative point of view, but some of the feedback that we got was individual doctors saying, I wanna know, um, what my, okay, you tell me my cost per case is high. I wanna see what's different between what I'm doing and what my colleagues who are low cost are doing. And I wanna know what they're using to control pain, control bleeding, do whatever it is that I'm spending a lot on. So I described that clustering algorithm. Imagine we had the ability to show what specific items within this category, hematological agents, so which hematological agents are being used by the doctors in cluster one, the doctors in cluster two, the doctors in cluster three, et cetera. So you click on hematological agents, and what you can see is each column in this next visualization, in this heat map, represents the spend per case of doctors in cluster one, cluster two, and so on. So for example, the doctors in cluster five and six you can see that their spend is really substantial for this particular clinical scenario on that first agent, Reapro, and on that second agent, Bivalrudin, which many of you will know are very expensive agents that we sometimes use in the context of PCI. Whereas the doctors way on the left, their spend on these agents is very low. Why that spend difference? 
And so if I hover over the cluster on the far right, that's cluster number five, the most expensive cluster, what you can see is that they are using this particular agent, Reapro, 22% of the time. That was in seven out of 32 cases. Whereas on the far left, those doctors are using it 0% of the time. That was two out of 3,497 cases. So is there an opportunity? There might be, and this is the, this is, I'm about to show you why we built this whole visualization. It was to enable conversations between clinicians. And so if you scroll just a little further to the right, what you can see in this visualization is every single doctor's name along with their cost per case and what cluster they fall in. So you can find yourself in this graph, and you can see how you compare to your colleagues, and you look and you go, huh, I'm in cluster five here, meaning my cost per case is very high. This guy I respect is in cluster one, and his office is across the hall from mine. Let's have a conversation. A couple other visualizations that I'll share. The, this particular visualization was built for the persona of the medical director of um, a group of physicians doing some particular thing. So for example, let's say you're the medical director of orthopedics at one particular hospital, and you wanna see how your physicians are doing on cost at that particular hospital. And so what I've done here is I've selected on the far left of the graph one particular hospital. In the next visualization, you can see the way this particular sequence of visuals work, the way this dashboard works actually is you scroll to the right to kind of dive deeper and deeper into the data. Okay, so what you can see first is total cost per case and the, the kind of dark blue circles represent my doctors. These are the doctors at that one hospital that I've selected. That kind of in the background, all those blue circles represent all the doctors in the system who have achieved whatever volume threshold I selected in the dashboard. The next visualization, those bar charts, are for each of my doctors, what their average spend is on each of those various different cast, uh, cost categories, and you can see those like little, little vertical lines, they represent the system average and the reference cluster cost per case for that particular thing. Um, the, uh, the asterisks, again, represent statistical significance. You can create a league table if you want. So if you say, I wanna see just every doctor's cost, every doctor compared in terms of their cost per case for supplies, you can do that. You can move over to sort of a detailed heat map and see, huh, this guy's spend on, I don't know, bone cement is very high. I wonder if that's consistent over time. You can click on that particular, that particular cell. So that cell there represents one doctor's spend on bone cement over whatever period of time you've selected, average cost per case, and you see that it's high, and I'm sorry that if you can't see this, but it's considerably higher than the system average in the reference cluster. Those pieces of information are provided beside it, and so you, is this consistent over time, or was there just some weird you know, one-time event? So you click on that, you can see a trend line showing this is consistent over time, and then you go, why? What's specifically driving it? So this is yet another way to drill down to that same kind of critical information. What is leading to this, what specific item or element of practice is leading to this difference. And so now you've got, I've just scrolled over to the right and I'm looking at two tables. The table on the left is showing what this doctor uses for antibiotic bone cement. And you can see 96% of the time he uses this antibiotic impregnated cement, which is very expensive. And on the right is what everybody else uses in this category. Okay, and this is just to round this out. We also, we have so many different metrics in here and they have every metric, as you guys know, has its own you know, latency and update frequency, et cetera. This is the like painful world that we live in. And so we have a tab in these dashboards that, um, that creates transparency around that. Okay, I'll skip our executive view. Because um, I want to answer this question. I get asked this question a lot. Like, do doctors care about this data? So this is an actual photo of my partner in crime, Caleb Stowell. He's also a doctor. He's on my team, and he leads a lot of our value work. He's sitting at the front of the room showing one of these league tables. This is related to OR time to a group of surgeons who are the surgeons who are on this graph. And, and if you look at their body language, <laughs> they're... They are really paying attention to this information. The doctors really do care. And I, I strongly believe that, you know, much as doctors, um, you know, there's this notion that doctors don't like being told what to do. Doctors don't like being shown that, you know, they're worse than somebody else. Fine. But I also believe that doctors, one of the biggest challenges of our time in healthcare is the crisis of affordability. 
right? As a nation, we all know that. We cannot afford how much we pay for healthcare. We pay you know, more than $10,000 per person in this country. No doctor wants to contribute to that problem if they can help it. And so we found that clinicians have been very engaged with this. Of course, sometimes you're moving somebody's cheese. Certain things are easier to change than others. If I have time, I can give you some interesting examples of that. But fundamentally, we've found doctors to be very engaged with this information. Here's an example of how we engage information. The, the very last example I showed you, there was that doctor whose cost per case on bone cement was particularly high relative to his colleagues. And so it turns out that that's one of the more common, we call them value drivers, one of the more common things that causes some, some docs to be higher cost than others when we're talking about knee replacements. So you ask doctors, why do you use, why is your bone cement so expensive? So it turns out because they use this antibiotic impregnated stuff. Every doctor uses bone cement when they do these knee replacements, but some doctors use the antibiotic stuff, which costs four times as much as the non-antibiotic stuff. Right? And so you say to them, why do you use the antibiotic stuff? And they say, of course, I just want to prevent prosthetic joint infections. Those are really terrible things to happen to patients. And so you look at the world literature on this, and there's almost nothing. And it's mostly industry sponsored. And the orthopedic guidelines basically kind of throw their hands up and say, you know, a physician may exercise their judgment to use antibiotic impregnated cement. OK, so not helpful at all. So what we were able to do, because many of our physicians wanted to use this antibiotic impregnated cement, was we said, OK, let's take a look at the last two years' worth of cases, um, elective, primary, unilateral, total knee arthroplasty across our system. And what you're looking at here is the distribution of bone cement cost per case across our physicians. So many physicians have a very low bone cement cost per case. That's that big spike. Because they never use antibiotic impregnated cement. They think that it's a you know, bone cement uh, sort of industry um, you know, marketing scam. And then you have the doctors at the right. You see like that, that bump towards the right. Those are the doctors who always use the really expensive antibiotic impregnated cement because they like, I don't know if it works, but I sure don't want my patients getting infections. Remember, one of the outcomes that we've collected on all these patients, because it passed a give a test, is did these patients develop bone infections? So we're able to look to see whether it is the case that the doctors on the far right, the really expensive doctors, experience, their patients experience lower bone infection rates than the doctors on the far left of this graph. What you can see, if you can read that, is that it is not the case that doctors who use consistently the really expensive antibiotics uh, impregnated cement have patients who experience a lower infection rate than doctors um, on the left. So what kind of impact does producing this information have on our clinicians? So here's what's happened over the, the last year, which has been the, the year that we've actually had this in place. What we're looking at here is um, the trend in specifically bone cement cost per case across our system. And what you can see is that as we've been promulgating this information around our system, we've gone from $265 a case to $189 a case. And, and if you're thinking, well, $75 a case, that's not a lot, um, A, we do 10,000 of them a year, and B, their bone cement isn't the only thing we're focused on, right? Every doctor, as I mentioned at the beginning, has opportunities. And here's an example of the types of opportunities. Our room and board spend, after we normalize our cost, across our high volume doctors ranges from $660 a case to more than $2,000 a case. Supply costs, um, we heard from Paul Lampy this morning about Aquamantis, that's also an issue with us. Some of our doctors love it, some of our doctors don't. It is very expensive. Sometimes we found that when we talk to doctors about these very expensive supplies, we'll say, that's $500 a case. They'll say, really? The rep told me that it was $10 a case. Interesting. Um, you know, some doctors like to use stems and some don't. Lab test patterns are different. Time spent in the OR is enormously different across physicians, and that's an example of something that's challenging to change. Um, and then the use of medications is a really nice example where there's lots and lots of opportunity. And so by revealing to every physician ways in which their practice appears to contain waste that they can reduce without 
adverse effects for their patients, and maybe with good effects for their patients, um, we've been able across a whole bunch of different elements of care to reduce cost per case. And so to give you an example of how this is added up across our system in where the example that I started with, total knee replacements, we've gone from about $8,900 a case to $8,600 a case. And to get to break even at Medicare rates, we've got to be down to about $8,200 a case. And so we are moving in the right direction. And this is in the face of very powerful inflationary pressures, especially in our labor market. Um, and to give you one more sense of that, um, this is what's happened once we indexed all of our costs for all of the different clinical areas that we're looking at across all of our different hospitals, um, each color represents one of our different regions. And so historically, what happens to our costs is they go up and up and up and up. And what you're seeing over the last, over the five quarters or so represented here is that they're either flat or coming down. And so we believe that we are bending the cost curve, again, in the face of really, really profound inflationary uh, pressures. So next steps, just one, one kind of quick thing about this. Uh, a limitation of what we've done so far is that the data um, are only built out for certain specific clinical conditions, and we're working on now expanding that to everything that we do in the inpatient setting. We're also working on our integration so that we can simplify our architecture and don't have to kind of pre-bake the stats before the users look at them. Um, and for certain elements, uh, we're also hoping to incorporate dashboard user entry. Okay, I will stop there, because I've talked a lot, and maybe people have some questions. A huge round of applause for a phenomenal body of work. Thank you, Ari. We, are, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Except for orthopedics and cardiac surgery, where physician attribution is pretty clear, <laughs> how did... <laughs> How do you overcome the attribution Thank you. for medical cases? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that question. Okay, so part of why we built, we built this out, you've heard on all the examples that I've been talking about pretty much, they've all been surgical type examples. They are for precisely that reason. Um, so how do we deal with attribution? What we actually did for this new version of value-oriented architecture that encompasses everything that we do in the inpatient setting was one of the biggest problems that we had to tackle. I wouldn't say solve, because I don't know that there's a, one solution, but one of the biggest problems we had to tackle was exactly that. How do we figure out attribution for medical cases where a patient might be in the hospital for 10 days and have four different hospitalists and eight different residents and 12 different consultants, et cetera? So we actually pulled together a work group that had 39 different clinicians from across our entire system on it, representing 16 different hospitals, and we spent months hashing out how are we going to deal with attribution. The like extreme, uh, the extremely simplified version of, of what we ended up building was attribution that works in several different ways depending on what type of metric you're looking at. However, one of our forms of attribution does attribution at the level of the patient day so that we use data in the EMR, including notes data, to figure out who was the doctor who was most in charge for each patient day and then who were consultants, et cetera. Um, and then if for certain metrics, we can leave the attribution at the level of the patient day. For example, if the, the, if the metric is spend per thousand patient days on antibiotics or blood products for patients with a certain DRG and a certain severity of illness, there we just leave it at the level of the patient day. If the metric is um, you know, maybe it's mortality and we want to just attribute one doctor to the whole stay, so what we can do is um, look at how many different days for a patient's stay, each doctor was the person in charge and either give the whole hospitalization to the doctor who had the most patient days and we have tie-breaking methodology, et cetera, or we, in case you ask, or um, we can actually prorate the hospitalization, you know, so break it out, attribute 30% of that mortality to one doctor who covered the patient for 30% of the days, et cetera. Th that's like the super short version of the answer to that question, but uh, again, and I don't pretend that we have it absolutely solved. Hi, uh, great work, great presentation. Um, not so much a question, just a statement. We did some of the same exact work um, with the, uh, the knee replacements, and um, one thing that the surgeons, we find, we had somebody from pharmacy there, and they said a little $3 thing of vancomycin mixed in with the bone cement does the exact same thing. And so just, and I've talked to other people about that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. For no, me. it's great. And in fact, some of the, what we, here, 
let me go back to this graph for a second. So funny you should say that. Um, we started spreading the information that I described around here. Um, sorry, you can't see my arrow. In the first few months of this graph, and you can see that we did achieve some reduction in a bone cement cost per case. So some doctors who were using the antibiotic and pregnant cement just totally switched over. There were other doctors who totally refused to switch over. And so then we switched to using the sort of technique that you're describing where we'd mix it right into the, we'd mix an antibiotic for spiritual reasons into the bone cement <laughs> and then put it into the patient. And that's when we convinced the other doctors to move over. So that was that kind of second reduction. Awesome, one, one last question. And you saw also be coming from this side. Can you just talk about the organization's commitment and investment into doing this? So how long have you been doing it? How long did it take to get to an MVP product? How, how big is your team? Yeah, um, so complicated question um, because it does take a large cast. I would say, okay, the dedicated team working on this close to full time is about five people. Um, However, many other individuals are impacted. There's uh, you know, a lot of work that needs to be done on the IT side, which is outside of my team to help support this. And critically, there's a very substantial amount of work that needs to be done by the institutes to like, gather physicians together, get physicians to you know, validate the data, answer you know, the give a darn question, et cetera. And I can't quite quantify that, but if you want, I could help think that through afterwards. Um, so there's that. How long did it take to get an MVP? About three months from like, nothing at all to something that we were putting in front of orthopedic surgeons. Um, and we have been doing this work for, I'd say, the last two years. Um, for the last year or so, it's sort of really been adopted in a substantial way. It was very exciting and terrifying to me about a year ago when the organization decided to attach executive bonuses to how we're performing on reducing cost per case. So this is now extremely high visibility around the organization. Um, and. Uh, and, and, you know, we're really seeing movement. Awesome. Huge round of applause for Dr. Ari Rabisak for what is clearly one of the finest presentations delivered on the healthcare and life sciences track. And I have huge envy for, for your audience from tomorrow morning who are going to experience Thanks. this. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Ari. Truly, truly appreciate it. Thanks.